Hey everybody, it's Linda, and I am here with Brian Smith, the founder hey, of Unboost. Hey guys, how you in doing? In person, personal. Well, first of all, where's the camera on this thing so I can? It's up it right, right up there. Here, okay, yes. cool. <laughs> Make sure I'm looking at the right place. So today I'm going to talk to Brian. We're going to talk about you know the birth of a brand, which is his book, Birth of a Brand. And if you stick around to the end, we're going to give away two books today. Cool. Cool. But we're actually you're going to be able, eligible to win until Sunday. Okay, Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific time. But today we're going to talk about the book. We're going to talk about how did Ugg go from $500 in his pocket to a billion dollar company. Absolutely amazing. This is all about branding. So if you are interested in um, this pro this process, please share this with your friends on your page as well. And before we get started, Brian, I want to tell you about something. I belong okay. to a mastermind group and it's called Stigula Success Mastery. Right. And they are sponsoring our show today. Oh, fantastic. Awesome. Way to we go, love way to go, guys. sponsors. Yeah. yeah. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, go to attendssm.com. And then again, remember, stick around. You're going to comment with the word UG in the comments, and this is going to make you eligible to win one of the books. We're giving away two books, okay? So, Brian, let's hear it. How did you get started? <laughs> 500 bucks in your pocket? What's up with that? I got well, 500 bucks. Can I make a billion-dollar well, company? I don't know, but the, it goes back even further before the 500 bucks. I, I was an accountant in Australia, and I finally graduated after 10 years, and I – quit the same day I graduated. Ten years for school? Yeah, oh. it, it, I was doing st studying at night and working at day. Okay. And uh, I had this feeling that I always wanted to be in business for myself. And, mm -hmm. and I had an inspiration to come to California because all the trends were coming out of California into Australia, like water beds and Levi jeans and all the surf brands and everything. And so I wanted to get into a business and find the next big thing in California that I could bring back to Australia. Was it Beanie Babies? No, I didn't. <laughs> Not Beanie Babies. That, that was another one. But <laughs> anyway, something like that. And so I came to California and spent a couple of months here trying to looking around for the next big thing. And while I was killing my time, I was surfing at Malibu mm -hmm. uh, nearly, e nearly every day, you know. And, uh, you know, after three or four months, I still hadn't found the thing. And then it was getting to be September, October. And the water was getting cold, yeah. and uh, I had my sheepskin boots from Australia, and I, I was putting them on on the beach one afternoon, and I and I went, oh my god, I got goosebumps. There's no sheepskin boots in America. So you literally had that epiphany was dropped on you. Oh, it was, it was, it was life changing because I, I my, my whole body sort of got convulsed in goosebumps. Well, can I go back to sure. when you dropped out of school because you. So you were 10 years, and while you were in school for that 10 years, did you have any kind of inkling or thoughts that, that maybe this might not be the right path? Or were you like, I'm on the right path, this is No, it. I never liked it. You never liked I, it? I was okay. doing it mostly because my parents said it was a you know, steady career. Right. But, I, but it wasn't right. me. And, and I don't give up on things, which is why I exists today. I don't give up easily, mm -hmm. and we'll talk a lot about that. And we were talking about that earlier yeah. because you know, I've tried surfing and I didn't try for very long. I yeah, gave up on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, anytime you give up, you're never going to get you know the big big reward. There you go, the, golden nugget. Yeah. The bottom line is that that you know even though I I was an accountant, I didn't and had a, a, a goosebump moment when I was meditating in Australia because I was thinking. You know what? What the hell can I do? And and that's when I thought, you know, all the things are coming out of California. I got goosebumps then as well. Okay. So so yeah, I do tune in to my inner inner being quite a bit. The and goosebumps do they last long, or is it kind of like a fleeting thing? It, have it's, you noticed? It's it's it just it's just a wake up. It's like it's not an awareness. To to me, you know, I, I do a lot of meditation. I'm very spiritual. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I believe that there's a a, a fragment of God in it, every one of us, mm -hmm. and it, it has a mission where it wants our lives to go. Right. And any time that we make a decision that's in alignment with that inner guidance, it the only way it can say way to go, Brian, is 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 through the electrochemical system that we have. It's called goosebumps. So right. so I I've always tuned in. Every time I get goosebumps now, I go, uh oh, that was. That must be something momentous. What? Mm -hmm. Let me analyze that. And you, nearly every time, it's it's like a change of thought or a change of direction. 
in my life. So goosebumps, I, I you know, tell everybody now, every time you get them, just, just sit back and analyze what, what just happened. Listen to those goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever um, gotten scared and not gone forward with something like that when you've had that? Um, no, usually it's when I've made the decision to go uh -huh. is when I get the reward of the goosebumps. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's okay. not goosebumping me to take action. It's it's after the action's taken. It goes, where to go, Brian? We're on you. We're, we're with you. You know, I've never even thought about it, but that is so true because I, I make that decision to do something, yeah. and then when I step into it, I get – that's when the giddy and that's, and like that's when the validation comes. Yeah. yeah, that that's 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 to me is okay. That was a good decision. Let's follow it up. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Okay. So then you were in you were um, in California. You had this epiphany that. <gasps> yeah. No sheepskin boots. So you know, one in two Australians own some sort of sheepskin footwear, and so it it just made me think. God, if one in two Americans own some right. sort of footwear. I mean, that's a hell of a goal. And, uh, you know, I never ever expected I'd get one in two Americans doing it. But then we're, we're, we're pretty, pretty close. Yeah. You know? And some it, of them own more than one pair. Yeah. Some of them own <laughs> 10 pairs. Yeah. Uh, so, but back then it was just, you know, this is going to be huge. And so uh, I was with, serving with a buddy and, and I said to him, man, let's, let's, you know, make some calls, get some samples in, mm -hmm. and we'll go into business. We're going to be instant millionaires. You know, you've, you've heard that before. Can you believe you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that, yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah. younger, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we ended up, you know, we called up at this factory in Australia and got six pairs of samples in, and, and Doug was going to be the salesman because I was terrified of sales. I, okay. I was so fearful. I was going to be the accountant. And he went out there for the first, you know, couple of weeks and, and came back with about 150 business cards of every single shoe retailer that he'd visited. Okay. And not a single order. And they, they just say, oh, you're crazy selling sheepskin in California? Get out of here. Mm -hmm. right? But the the uh, reality is that Australia's climate is exactly the same as California. Just, so, just backwards, right? Yeah, so, it's, it's, so I knew that was not the right reason. And it struck me that, that you know, all my buddies up at Malibu think this is the best idea in the world. And Doug and I were talking about it. We thought, oh, of course, they've all been to Australia and they've surfed down there and they all brought sheepskin boots back for their buddies. Mm -hmm. So within the surfing community, sheepskin boots were pretty common. Right. And the word UG was sort of, you know, getting out. And so Doug and I, you know, changed gears and we went uh, to hit all the surf shops up. And so we, you know, he was going to take the valley and he, he was insistent that I'd do all the beach okay. stores. And man, he was on the road for like three or four days, and I every morning refused to go out. I was so scared. Mm, of, give me of, five because uh, you've conquered that. <laughs> yeah, I was so scared. And uh, I finally I, I got guilty because I knew he was out there. And so I, you know, got my samples and I went down to the closest surf shop in Santa Monica called Con Surfboards and I. And I walked in real sheepish. I had my samples in this little bag. Was that a pun? No, yeah, I, no, I didn't <laughs> think of that. But uh, I sort of opened up the bag when I walked in and, and he goes, oh, sheepskin boots, man. They're, what are you doing with those? They're the best. And I went, well, I'm thinking of going into business. You know, I'm bringing them into America. And he goes, oh, fantastic. You'll make a fortune. You know, okay. those, those things are great. And and I thought, wow, this selling's not so bad. <laughs> yeah. And so I went to the next store, and it was the same thing. Oh, Ugg boots, man, they're great. I've got a pair. You know, a friend bought them back from Australia. And over the next two days, all the way down the coast, you know, to San Diego, I'm just getting this incredible response. Mm -hmm. And so I'm now thinking I'm a bulletproof salesman, you know. Right. But but when Doug and I got back to the, the you know my little house in Santa Monica. We never, re you know, it never occurred to us that we hadn't asked for any orders. Oh no! Because <laughs> we didn't, we didn't have any inventory. <laughs> and what's the point? You know, this was just an idea. But we were so enthused that we were going to be instant millionaires that that we, you know, decided to raise some money because we had to buy product. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another interesting story. You know, you you've you heard that saying that that once you start out on a path, the universe conspires to work with you. Yes. It's very ancient. That's, that's probably thousands of years old. Well, 
my buddy Doug and I were discussing what we needed and my roommate overheard us and he says, oh, there's some guys at my office who want to invest in new companies. So we raised like 20 grand without even doing a business plan. Wow. And we sent 15 to Australia and that's worth like eighty or $90,000 today, you know. But there was a lot of money and, and we sent most of it down to Australia and ordered 500 pairs mm -hmm. and they finally arrived and we went back. the story gets good. Yeah, we went back out onto the <laughs> – onto the you know, the road with it. This time I go back with my big bag full of product and an order pad and I went back to con surfboards and then John goes, hey, well, you know, what are you doing here? And I said, well, hey, here's all the boots now. How many do you want? And he goes, oh, well done, Brian. But, you know, we couldn't sell them out of our store. We just sell surfboards and trunks and sandals right. and, and they're way too expensive for us, you know. But good luck, you'll do great in the shoe stores. And it was like oh. that happened over and over and over oh, again gosh. all the way down the coast and the same with Doug. And it ended up our first year sales of UGG was 28 pairs. 28 pairs. Yeah, we bought 500 because we were going to be so <laughs> successful. And oh, we couldn't give them away, you know. The, we did our best to put 28 pairs. Mm -hmm. And that was really the uh, huge disappointment. Yeah. But it set up something that I've noticed all my life with every single business is and it's the theme of the book again I will show you the book birth of the brand. right um the theme is you can't give birth to adults right you know? and I right? love that it's so cool every business starts with can someone conceiving it and their first action is taken and that's the birth for us six pairs of samples was the birth of Ugg and then everything just it just lies there after that and mm -hmm. that's when most entrepreneurs give up because they've given it their best shot and then nothing really happens yeah. and they go, oh, my God, it's not working. And, you know, a lot of them give up right then. But it's a normal part of every growth cycle, you know. You have to be an infant. You, you, there's no amount of overfeeding or jiggling the cradle. An infant can't go to college, mm -hmm. right? It has to go through toddling, which is a great stage, you know, all the – you know, new believers are buying your product and there are people are writing articles about you. Right. And then you'll get into the youth, which is consistent orders coming in and, and consistent deliveries, consistent accounting and customer service. And then you'll get into the, you know, the teenage years, which if it's a really good product and that's super dangerous because you Where want people start gossiping about it. Well, no, this, is, this, <laughs> Teenagers. Is, this is when, no, this is more like where you want to be in every party in town, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. And, uh, the, the, uh, you want to be in trade shows all across the country, which you can't afford. You want to be in every big mm. retailer. You can't afford the product and, and it's super dangerous where you get too big, too quick. Right. And that's so, but if you can manage that, it becomes a mature company. So anyway, that, that, Back to the 28 pairs, hugely, hugely disappointing. But uh, well, what made you guys keep going, you know? Well, Doug, you know, we, we obviously didn't make a million dollars. Right. So he went and got another job. Okay. And I was stuck, you know, and, and I couldn't really give up because I had, you know, 480-something pairs in the warehouse, you know, my, my third bedroom, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, so I started doing swap meets and um, – you know, street fairs. Okay. But the biggest deal I did was I got this um, um, system going where I'd go surfing at Malibu and it, I'd fill the van. I had a big van. I'd fill it up full of product and I was open for business and I used to get a ton of business oh, from awesome. all of the people that were so strong that, you know, even if the surf was crappy, I'd still go there and just open the car mm -hmm. up and, and be selling business, you know, products. So, so that was how it sort of get, got going. Let's talk about your some of your ads, your first ads. Yeah, yeah the the uh, the first ads were the boo, boo boo ads. Yeah, <laughs> these were. Uh, I thought I was doing fantastic advertising. You know, I had these beautiful models, and I posed them on the beach at Wind and Sea, a guy and a girl, the perfect hair and clothing and everything, and you know the sales would, went like to, to ten thousand dollars, which was like. So disappointing. For a year? Yeah, for the season, you know. Oh, wow. And okay. so, you know, so I had to get another summer job, right? This is the second summer job. So the next year I got better-looking models and I posed them on the beach again and the sales, like, went to 20000 which, again, was hugely disappointing. So that meant another summer job. And, and you know, I was, I was getting ready to figure out my advertising for the next year and I was having a beer with a buddy who owned a mm -hmm. surf shop 
and I was telling him this problem, and he just says, oh, Brian, you know, he calls out to these guys, little kids out the back, and you, little 13-year-old grommets, and they come out, and he says, what do you think of Uggs? And he says, oh, those Uggs, man, they're so fake. Have you seen those ads? They, those models, they can't surf. And instantly mm. I realized I'm sending the wrong message to my target market, which is young surf kids, you know. Right. And it made me, as soon as they said that, I just went, oh, my God, I knew how fake these ads were. They were totally contrived and posed. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so I switched gears and I, I had a buddy of mine was running this collegiate surf team and, and I said, you know, Pete, any of you, these young kids going to go pro soon because I, I, I need some cheap guys to sponsor. And he gave me Mike Parsons and Ted Robinson, who were two young up-and-coming guys. Okay. And instead of the expensive photographer, I just went surfing with them to Black Beach and Trestles. And we, uh, you know, I just took photos of them walking along the, the roads, you know. And, and But these are iconic walks. And I knew that every kid who reads a surfer magazine is going to wish to God he was walking down that road with yeah, Mike Parsons wow. or Ted Robinson, you know. And, you know, Blacks and Trestles were the two we featured. And I ran them in the, the surfer magazines and the action sports magazines in October. And the sales for that season went to 200,000 plus. Whoa, so and from 10 to 20 to 200,000. Was it yeah. the following year? It was, it was in following succession, season. yeah. Okay. And, and it was purely because I nailed the, the image and it, and it made me realize with marketing and advertising, yeah. you never advertise your product. You always advertise the benefits or the feelings or the emotion. If you can get a reader em emotionally involved in the ad like those, those kids wanted to be walking down that road to Black's Beach, you know, go surfing yeah. with Mike Parsons. Yeah. That was that was the power of the ad. The, the first ads. The, like, I want that. Yeah. Right? The, the first ads, the product was like one third of the page because I wanted to focus on Ugg. Mm -hmm. The ads that worked, the product was like minuscule. You could only see the guy's feet because it's all beach and ocean and, and the roads and everything. And so the product was immaterial to the ad. Okay. But the feeling that, that uh, wow, if I wear a pair of Ugg boots, I'm going to get to do that and feel that way. And that, so that's, that's really when, when I, be, I was born uh, again as a marketer that day right, when, right. I, when I ran those ads because, you know, that, marketing then became a passion for me. And that, that's why I became worldwide is that I'd figured out how to position it in a way. You unlock that, that key. That, that would right? appeal to people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can, I'm going to throw you, throw you in the spot, put you in the spot here, and I'm going to ask, um, can you help me with my branding right now? I'm doing my best. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about just a little bit, like maybe you can steer our audience in different ways about thinking about their branding. Okay, so my branding is a, a coaching program, right. right? And it's for fear. Like I help women yep. break through their fears. It's great. Yeah. So tuning into the emotion that I want that, like I want to break through my fears what is the best way for me to figure out how to uh, brand that, market that out in the public? Um, off the top of my head, uh, first of all, you, you've got to let them in on what the fear is. Okay. So you've got to ask the question in a way that they they align with their fear, right? Okay. So they know they have it. And then you've got to give them a solution of where you've what you've been successful at helping people overcome a okay. fear. And if they can, if they can, first of all, engage in, in it, like, oh, my God, that's me, and, wow, there's an answer, that's the way to brand yourself. But you have to show the solution in a way that is easy for them to buy or purchase right. or, you know, to, to train in, you know, they've got to know what the commitment is and all that sort of stuff. That's the details. Okay. But catching them up front is, is giving them the, the – making them aware of their fear mm -hmm. and their problem and having a solution to overcome it. Okay. Right. Now, have you gone? Are you going through any? Do you go through any fears now? Or oh, well, everyone does. Yeah. Okay. I just yeah. wonder because I've asked people, yeah. you know, different people, what their fears are, and I've been amazed to find out some of the answers. Like one of them was, "I'm fearful of boredom." Right. It's like, wow, that's a very interesting one. Yeah. I've never feared of that, you know. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. What's your fear? Oh. Um, I don't have any like life threatening fears, mm -hmm. but, but, um, I, I, you know, I wonder, have I set myself up for a great retirement? Have I set my kids up for a great yeah. retirement? You know, because the, the things that I do, 
uh, subject to like I, I got completely wiped out in the recession, you know, 2009 mm -hmm. through 2014. I had everything, millions of dollars all set up in place from the UG business. I had a great new business in the construction products industry, making precast walls. Mm -hmm. And the economy stopped, construction stopped. I had millions of dollars invested in this huge plant and then that stopped. And then that led to a whole bunch of, you know, miscellaneous legal stuff right. that just sucked me down. And, wow. and so, you know, now that I've got out of that and I'm back on the road, I'm, I'm doing great now. I'm mm -hmm. doing a lot of speaking, yeah, and keynote speaking, keynote yeah. speaking and, and I've got my life together. I'm in, you know, invested in some really cool businesses that I'm helping with and, and I'm, you know, doing good by, by all, you know, average standards. Mm -hmm. But the fear is there that, well, what what's going to take that away? Right, because you were already there. I've already been there. And, you know? like, yeah. and it was yeah. no doing of mine that the recession hit. Exactly. It, it, and so, and I thought I was invested smartly, but I was, obviously wasn't. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so anyway, that that's, that's probably the only fear I have. I don't have any fear of starting new businesses or fear of, meeting people or fear. I don't have a fear of public speaking, although I'm always super nervous before I go on stage. Oh, you are. Oh, you're totally, okay, so what totally. do you do to get yourself up on, like how much before you go on stage are you not nervous or is it not until you get on stage? And then what do it, you do to break through that? Well, it's, it's like I used to play really high level of rugby, you know, international rugby. Okay. And if I wasn't nervous and scared before a game, I never played well. Oh, interesting. Right? Okay. It, it was, it's part of the build-up. And making you're taking it seriously, you know. If you if you didn't have a fear, it means you're not taking it seriously. You mm. don't give your audience the best. So, I um, I just rehearse my notes. You know, I don't speak from a script. I just speak out of my right. you know what what I feel like. But the last thing I say when I'm getting caught, you know, introduced is God. Please let me help at least one person in this audience mm -hmm. today. Yeah, and that's the one that sort of you know getting choked up here because that's when that spirit kicks in. Well, I'm getting choked up with yeah, you. That yeah, that spirit that's... kicks in. And